and screwed news. Today, the average American CEO earns 300 times the amount of the average American worker. That's right, you heard me, 300 times the amount of the average American worker. In some industries, it's as high as 1,000 times. Amazing as it seems in this day of rising inequality, things weren't always this way. Back in 1965, for example, CEOs at the nation's 350 biggest companies in America each earned just 20 times more than their employees. But that was when we had sensible tax policies that taxed the super rich at 91% after they started making 20 times what their employees made, which gave them an incentive not to make too much more than their workers. And that was before Reagan changed the rules so the CEOs could be compensated with stock options for which they pay taxes at about half the rate that you and I pay. Ever since both of these things happened, the CEO to worker pay ratio has skyrocketed, which raises the question, if we want to make our country prosperous and equal again, and raising taxes or changing compensation rules is, thanks to Republicans, out of the question, shouldn't we pass a law mandating that CEOs can't earn more than 30 times what their workers make? Let's ask Steve Beeman, chartered economist and chairman to the Society to Advance Financial Education. Steve, welcome. Hi, Tom. It's great to be on with you. Thank you. This, this seems like a, a sensible compromise to me. We, what we've seen with 35 years of Reaganism is that as the CEOs have gotten richer and richer and richer, the pay of average working people has become completely flat. When Reagan came into office, the largest employer in America was GM, and the average factory worker was making $54 an hour in today's money. Today, the largest employer, 30, 35 years of Reaganism later, the, the largest employer in America is Walmart, and the average pay is less than $10 now. It's $9 and change. Well, you and I would clearly have a little different take on this. Um, I think some of the dynamics that create that problem are not necessarily even governmental policy. I think it's a shift in the way economies work. If you look at General Motors as a core manufacturing economy that used to exist, we've replaced a lot of those jobs with technology. And that is going to naturally change the dynamic of wage compensation. But I think it's an interesting issue you that bring up. Technology is being made overseas, though, and that's our trade policy, and that's a government policy, Steve. Well, and I, you and I would agree on that. I think it's a dangerous, slippery slope, though, when we start to get a jealousy economy, we start to look at CEO pay as the problems. No one's looking to cap the pay of major league ball players or entertainers. We're looking to cap the pay of the people who build these companies. Well, and since uh, half of America, but let me, half of America uh, no, owns Steve, the stocks. I'm, I'm fine with capping the pay of entertainers and, and you know, also. And and in fact, back, you know, back in the day, I mean, you know, you, you, you go back and you look at, you know, Bing Crosby and those guys. I mean, they weren't making the kind of money that entertainers are making today. You know, Lucille Ball, I mean, they were doing well, but they weren't making this kind of money. And the reason why is once they made about 20 times what the average worker makes, suddenly they were in the 91% tax bracket. And they said, enough already. And the reason why I'm saying this, Steve, and you're an economist, I, you would understand this, is that one, at a certain point, when somebody starts making more and more and more and more and more money, that money starts becoming non-productive in the economy. They put it in Swiss bank accounts instead of, you know, investing in factories and things. Or they're, or we, because we've changed our trade laws, they're investing in factories in China. But the fact of the matter is that it's not part of the productive economy. Whereas when it used to be that workers were making that money, what did they do? They went to the local store and spent that money to buy things which created demand, which grew the economy. We had four consecutive decades, the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, of over 3% average GDP per decade. The first time it had ever happened in the history of the United States, and it was all while the top tax rate was 91%. I, I think you make a very strong populist argument. I would disagree with your premise that that money is not put to good use. If we look, for example, at Pepsi, which is a big consumer company, the chairman of Pepsi made a salary of $1.6 million, which that's a lot of money. But the bulk of the compensation is off of stock. And that's because we've seen the markets rise because of interest rates being so low, frankly. But as she's rewarded for corporate earnings going up, that benefits all of the shareholders in Pepsi, which are the people who own 401ks and IRAs. So I don't think it's right to necessarily punish her and say, hey, you made too much, when in fact she made millions of people much more wealthier. But that's, that's the exact problem. I mean, before the Reagan administration, it was against the law to compensate CEOs with stock. And the reason why was because a CEO should have five constituencies. Their employees, the institution of the, of the company itself, the customers, the community, 
and the stockholders, the five constituencies. And, and so if you compensate them exclusively with stock, they feel free to say, screw you to the customers and start just importing Chinese junk. They feel, say, feel free to say, screw you to the employees and flatten their wages. They feel free to say, screw you to the, to the community and shut down the factories and move them to China. And they feel, feel free to say, screw you to the institution of the company. And they'll take a company and they'll bankrupt it. And they'll, they'll throw out the pension, steal the pension money and, and, and bankrupt it like Donald Trump has done seven or eight times. Uh, or, or combine it with some other company. I mean, this idea of compensating CEOs exclusively with stock or largely with stock is causing the destruction of American business. Well, I, I would take a different approach to that, clearly. I think you and I can have a good discussion about it. I respect your opinion, but the reality of the situation is these people don't have five constituencies. A CEO works exclusively for the board of directors whose sole constituency is the shareholder. If, to your point, they're bringing in crap from China, they'll lose their business. And that you and I could talk. That's General Motors. And what happened is GM should have been allowed to go out of business. The fact is that the management of that company did run it inefficiently and ran it sloppily and were overcompensated. So I think in general, though, the CEOs for most companies, it, the New York Times had an article in which they agreed that company performance is largely related to CEO compensation. The more they make, the better those companies do. And that benefits everybody. You know, according to the Institute for Policy Studies, 40% of the highest paid CEOs over the last 20 years have either been fired, bailed out, or sent to jail. Well, These are the guys I, I who think, should be making all this money? Well, I don't have a problem if a board of directors tries something. I sold my company to Charles Schwab. At that time, Dave Potrick was CEO. The board after that, he had made a couple of missed calls, and they let him go. Yeah. I think that's the shareholder's decision through the board of directors, and it keeps us out of a situation where crony capitalism becomes the mantra, and that scares me more than any of it. Steve, you have the last word. Thanks for dropping by tonight. Well, thank you so much.